Um, today, I, don't, I want to be quite brief today, and some of you will be saying, oh, that's good. Um, because I've said a few weeks ago, or even a couple of months ago, that I don't think we give God enough time, and by being a little bit more brief, if you like, gives us more time to pray, so I would hope that we could pray at the end. Um, today, I want to talk about something that we're probably not very good at, in one sense, and you're probably thinking, if we're not very good at it, then why does he want to talk about it? But it could be because we're not very good at it, that's why he wants to talk about it. And um, some people might be good at it, but that might not be good for other people. So the thing that I want to talk about today is perseverance and persistence. Somebody once said to me, what's the difference? They sound very, very similar. Well, there is a marginal difference. Persistence is choice. We have a choice whether we persist in doing something. In other words, is it worth it? Is it worth persisting in what we're doing? Perseverance means surviving. Surviving the toughest conditions and coming out on the other side better from when we went in. Like Jesus in the wilderness, spending 40 days being tempted, coming out better than when he went in. And when it comes to our work, our perseverance is the hard work you do after getting tired of doing the hard work that you've already done. Does that make sense? Jesus persevered, as I've said, in the wilderness. Moses persevered in bringing the people out of Egypt. Noah persevered in building an ark. Could you imagine no B and Q? No wicks, no power tools. We can think about that when you're doing all the work that we're doing in church at the moment. How difficult would that be? But he persevered. And for most of us, the two things are something that we probably do subconsciously. We do them without thinking. We do them because quite often we've got to do them. Being persistent in order to get things done or being persistent in delaying the inevitable. So there's sort of two sides to the same tale, if you like, like being the person that builds walls rather than building bridges, the person that loves to find excuses why they shouldn't do something. You know, when I came here in 2013, um, at the back of the church, there was like a little bit of a display with some drawings on it. I don't know whether you can remember those that was here back in 2013, nine years ago. The drawings were architect's drawings of what the church might look like if we did some reordering. And I suppose you could say that we've been persistent little by little. You know, no big thing, but little by little, you chip away at what needs to be done. And you could say that we've managed to by being persistent, get to the where we are today, and all you guys are having to sit on one side of the church because we've taken the pews out on the other side. But unfortunately, some of those goals take longer to achieve than we would hope or imagine. But nevertheless, we get there in the end because we persevered in order to get where we are, to get the job done. You know, things don't always work out in our timing. Things work out in God's timing. And we see that over and over again. We've heard it from Andy today. Things working out God's way. When we think, oh dear, what are we going to do? And then it, it just works out, doesn't it? And I think, you know, um, to some degree, having two years of COVID has taught us a lesson. It's taught us a lesson in what's important in our lives not just in our lives, but in the lives of those people around us. And only through situations like we get plunged into do you end up coming out better on the other side. It's taught us that perhaps we should get on and do what we believe that God is asking us to do. And I'm not just talking about reordering the church. I'm talking about, you know, what we do generally in our lives, what we do in our family lives. And that brings me to my first question of today. And I think the words are going to pop up on the screen. What is it that holds you back from doing the things that you think or believe God wants you to do? What is it that holds you back from doing the things that you think or you believe that God wants you to do? 
Let me tell you what it's not. It's not always having the resources in place before we start the task. Otherwise, none of us would have ever had any children. If you waited until you had everything in place to raise a child, you'd still be waiting. The knowledge, the competence, the expertise and the experience. You want to get experience by doing. So you definitely not have any of that. And then you come to the crucial part, the finances. Because according to the Compass Fostering Association, the average cost of raising a child to the age of 18 in 2019 was 185,000 pounds. Could you imagine that 185 grand to raise a child to the age of 18? Childcare, I think you get some of that free now from the government, but you've got to top it up either side. Education, you know that school's free, but university is not free. Interests and hobbies, pocket money, that'll be rising, won't it, with the cost of inflation. Clothes, always wanting new clothes, designer clothes, whatever clothes, birthdays, Christmases, technology, all the kids I know, all the youth who come to our youth group, all got nice phones. It's just the way of the times, isn't it? It's just where we are. Leisure, days out, and they all cost a lot of money. So what do we do? We just get on with it, don't we? We just get on with it. And when our, children's, when our children eventually arrive, we just manage. And we don't just manage, but we strive, don't we? We strive for a better life, not just for them, but for their children's children. We strive for a better life, not just for ourselves, but for them. And the reason I think that we do that is because it's part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. It's who God created us to be. He created us to be a persistent people. He created us to be a resourceful people when we think we don't have the resources to be able to do it. So just for a moment, I just want to stick with this theme about children because I think that children have got a lot to teach us about who we forget that we are. You see, children have a way of doing things because they don't know any differently. Or let me rephrase that. Children have a way of doing things because they've not been influenced by doing things the wrong way. They've not been influenced by negativity. They have a want and desire to get up. They have a want and desire to push forward, a want and desire to sit and to start crawling, to walk, and to move forward, and to do all the things that you want them to do in life. But they have their own want and desire to do that. Always reaching. If you know, children are always reaching. We went across to see Harriet the other day. She's sitting up, and she, you know, she's reaching out because it's part of who she is. If you've got a Bible, no, you've not got a Bible unless it's on your phone because we've moved them all. But anyway, they're all at the back of church. But Hebrews 11, 19th book in the New Testament. Um, but before I read from that particular part of Scripture, I just want to give you a little bit of context because quite often we read a little bit of Scripture, it's like taking a snapshot and we don't see the bigger picture. So let's just put it into context. Back in the first century after Jesus' birth, many religious people, Jews and Gentiles, had got questions about the religion of the early Christians. They were looking for evidence about this new faith. Is this new faith genuine? That was the questions that they were asking. You see, the Jews had got the miracle of crossing the Red Sea. They'd got the agreement with God on Mount Sinai. But they were saying, well, what do the Christians have? The Jews had got a wonderful uh, religious ceremonies that they used to perform. The high priest would offer sacrifices in the temple, but they were saying, but what do the Christians have? In other words, how could this new faith centered on Jesus offer forgiveness of sins and the friendship of God? And those are the questions that Paul is trying to answer when he writes this particular letter to try and explain what it's all about. And how we, or them, the Hebrew people, could be um, persistent in what they were thinking about. 
and to have that perseverance to push forward. And that's what chapter 11 is, and that's where I want to go. In the NIV Bible, the pew Bibles that we've put away at the back, there's headings on various sections of the Bible. And on Hebrews 11, it says, faith in action. So let me read from there. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Martin Luther King said this. He says, faith is taking the first step when you can't see the whole staircase. You've just got to do that sometimes. And we do that every day of our lives, unless you live in a bungalow. We do. We step up the stairs. We don't look at every step as we go in, and we definitely don't look at every step when we're coming down, but we take the first step, and we just know where the other steps are going to be. We've got to trust him at times, haven't we? Paul says this. He says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. By faith, Abel brought God a better sacrifice than Cain. Then I'll jump to verse 7. By faith, Noah was warned about things not yet seen. In holy fear, built an ark to save the family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of their righteousness. That is the keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Verse 23, by faith, Moses' his parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the other people, the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Verse 29 says, By faith the people passed through the Red Sea onto dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed. And verse 32 says this, What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, and Samson, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two, and they were killed by the sword." I don't know about you, but after reading this, I think my faith seems to be mild by comparison. You know, everyone in the world has a faith in something, but the big question is, where do you put your faith? Where do we put our individual faith? I know I've talked about walking upstairs and down, and we just do that naturally, but where do we put our true faith? Do we have a confident faith? Do we have a Hebrews 11 faith? Let me just read verse 1 again. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. And this is what it says in the message version, because I know that some of you love the message. It says, the fundamental act of existence is that this trusting God, this faith, 
is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. And I suppose what I'm saying is, are you willing to move forward in seeing what you can't see? Are you willing to put your trust in someone that you can't see? Are you willing to put your trust in someone that laid down his life for each and every one of us? Someone who conquered death and was raised to new life. I believe that we're at a time for participants and not passengers. And all this comes down to persistence and perseverance. And that comes from having a faith in believing what we believe God is wanting us to do. You know, in the Greek, the word for faith means either faith or faithfulness. And it's hard to work out whether Paul is actually talking about belief or behavior. It's like the Jews, you know, to say somebody is a Jew or Jewish, it's different. But you could still be a Jew and not be Jewish. So what I think it's all about really is about having a renewed mind. And we've talked about that many times, about having a renewed mind. Paul talks about it in Romans 12. He says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to be tested and approve what God's will is for you, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, asking yourself, am I living the best life I can? Could I be doing better? Could I shift my patterns of focus and change what I do? And that's all about getting a perspective on things, isn't it? It's about changing our patterns of focus. It's about renewing our mind. It's about changing the way that we think about things to create a better life, a better life for ourselves, better life for our families, better life for those people around us, a life that says I'm worth more than this, a life that honors God. You know, our society has patterns of persistence and persuasion that leads to broken lives. Patterns that are easy to fall into, but difficult to get out of. Mindless patterns, mindless routines that we find ourselves in just because that's the way of life. But there's a choice to say, I don't want to get stuck in those mindless patterns of life. You can break the pattern. It's like breaking the mold. Are we stuck in them? We have a choice. We have a choice and we can choose to focus on Jesus and we have a choice that we can focus on God's mercy and we have a choice that we can focus on God's love. Shall we pray? Father, we, we just thank you for being reminded that you are the one that just adores us and loves us and created us to give us that DNA to do the things that you believe are the right things for us to do. But we know, Lord, that we are tempted by the ways of the world, by patterns of life that we find in our societies, patterns of life that we find in the world around us, patterns of life that we find ourselves in that we don't really want to be in. And we say, Lord, will you help me? Holy Spirit, will you guide me? not to be in the patterns that are not right for my life, to cut me off from the things that are just wrong for me, and to give me your guidance to be able to move in a way of life that is honoring to you. So come Holy Spirit right now, just speak to us. Just fill us with your Spirit and lead us. Lead us from this moment in our lives to live a better life for you. In everything that we think, in everything that we do, in everything that we say, we want to do it for you, Lord. And we want that for ourselves and our children. And we want it for our children's children too. We want it for our friends and our neighbors, 
for those people that we don't yet know as friends, but you know who those friends will be. We want it for all our church community and the people that are not yet part of our church community that will be part of our church community next week and next month and next year. So come Holy Spirit and just fill us to a point of overflowing so that your love emanates from our very being, that it emanates out from ourselves and just gives people an encounter when they're in our presence. Father, we read in the Gospels that people were changed when they came into the presence of your Son. They were changed when they were in the presence of the disciples. And we want to be your disciples, doing the things that you want us to do. So guide us, Lord, in everything that we do. And we pray that from this day forward, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as always, uh, there'll be people around who can pray for you or pray with you. So if there's something that might have been stirred up in your heart or your mind uh, this morning uh, from what's been shared, um, just seek them out and um, find them, wherever they might be. Um, They might be down here.